Auth is scary and complicated. I mean, there's a reason there are so many companies that provide Auth services, but it doesn't have to be so scary. In this video, I'm gonna be breaking down exactly how Auth works, showing you step-by-step -step exactly what happens between the client and the server, and it's all gonna be done at a high level, so it's not gonna be specific to any language at all. Also, at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you examples of this on real-world websites, as well as an example of how to implement everything I'm talking about. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream projects sooner. And in order to understand auth, we first need to understand the differences between authentication and authorization. They actually sound very similar, but they are two very different things. The idea behind authentication is proving that you are who you say you are. This is essentially the step of logging into a website. You give it your email and your password, it verifies that your email and password are correct, and now the site knows that you are who you say you are. So if I sign in as myself, it knows that I am Kyle, and that's how you prove that you are Kyle to a website. This is step number one. Authorization, on the other hand, is just saying, do you have permission to do this thing? So there are different levels of users, different roles and permissions. For example, you could be an admin user, you could be a guest, you could be just a normal default user, and these permissions are tied to who you actually are. So me as Kyle, owning my YouTube channel, I am the owner of this channel. While when you are on YouTube and you view my channel, you can only view it as a viewer, like you can't edit or delete any of my videos. So the ability for me to edit and delete videos is tied to permissions that I need to be authorized to do, which is where authorization comes from. And this is essentially step number two. Once you are authenticated as yourself, then the server can authorize you to do different things. So that's the difference between authentication and authorization. It's okay if you're not 100% clear on the terminology, just understand that there are two different concepts. One is logging in and one is having permissions. So now that we understand the difference between these two terminologies, we need to understand exactly how auth works. And the whole idea behind auth is that it happens on the server. A lot of people think about auth on the client, like, okay, you know, I have this user, what can they do? What buttons can they click? But everything to do with auth happens on the server. And the reason for that is you cannot trust the client. So everything with auth has to happen on the server. And the two different processes, authentication and authorization, have a little bit of a workflow. So the way the server and the client communicate with each other is by request. So if you want to log in, the client is going to send a request to the server with your email and password and ask the server, is this person you know, able to log in? And who is this person with this credentials? Then the server will say, you know, this is who they are. So it's going to be that type of process. Now to talk about specifically authentication, that's going to be the login process. And what happens, like I already mentioned, first step is the client sends a request to the server that says, I have this email, I have this password, is this person a valid user? And if so, who exactly are they? Then what happens on the server is it's going to crunch that information and determine, does this user exist? If this user does exist, well, it's going to send that information back down to the client. It's going to say, hey, this is John. And what happens also on the server, if this is correct, is it's going to create a session. The session is just a unique ID specifically associated with John. And this unique ID is how the server determines that this is always you when you make further requests. So it's going to send down that specific ID saying that this is John, and it's going to be like, yep, you're good to go. On the client, you're then going to take that special ID and it's gonna be saved most likely in a cookie. That way, every time you make a future request that requires authorization, that cookie that has your specific ID for John is going to be sent along with your request. That way the server knows that this is coming from John. Now in the other scenario where, for example, the user does not exist, the server is just gonna say, hey, email, password, these are incorrect, you know, try to re-enter it, super basic stuff like that. Now for authorization, we touched on this just a little bit in the previous section, but what happens is the client is again going to make a request to the server. Let's say that you click on a button that's going to allow you to delete my YouTube channel. Well, I have permission to do that, but nobody else does. So it's gonna send up that little cookie that we talked about earlier, that ID that says, I am John. It's gonna send that up to the server and it says, does John have permission to delete Web Dev Simplified's YouTube channel? Obviously, or at least hopefully, John does not have permission to do that. So it's going to send down an error that's like, John does not have the ability to do this. Or for example, if you're trying to query a list of information and you send along your ID that is saying you are John, it's only going to return to you the items that you are allowed to access from that list of information. So if you're like a teacher of a classroom, it's only going to return to you the students that are in your classroom instead of all the students in the entire school. 
Now, obviously, if you pass up this ID and this ID for John does not have access to do something, it's going to give them an error. Otherwise, it's going to you know, return that data or allow them to do that specific thing. Now, the important thing to realize about these two different examples of authentication and authorization is that everything that is validating that the user can do what they want to do or validating the user is who they say they are is happening on the server. We're not checking emails and passwords on the client, and we're not allowing people to delete my YouTube channel from the client. All of that happens on the server, and that's the key. Whenever you do authentication, all the validation, all the source of truth has to come from the server since you cannot trust the client. Now it is 100% okay to use like Boolean variables like is admin to be able to show and hide different parts of your UI. For example, if a user is an admin, you may be able to want to show a delete or an edit button where a normal user doesn't have that. For example, when I go on YouTube, it shows an edit video button, which has a link for me to edit any of my videos underneath my video. And if I click on that link, it allows me to edit the video. But, you know, that could be behind a flag that says like, is this Kyle Cook? If it's not Kyle Cook, then don't show this. And if you change the UI, you change the client side so that that button shows up for you and you click it, obviously YouTube's not gonna let you edit my video. Instead, it's gonna throw you an error. So it's perfectly okay to show and hide things on the UI based on the actual, you know, user's data or the user information. But because you can change that information, I can go in and I can, you know, change my flag to admin flag on the client. You don't wanna actually trust any of that information. So you can show and hide things all you want, but the actual verification and authorization of if the user has access to that information needs to be handled on the server. So if you go ahead and add an edit video button underneath of my video by changing around your client side code and you click on it, the server of YouTube is gonna tell you, hey, that's funny, you tried to do that, but we're checking you on the server and you cannot do that at all. So just kind of to reiterate that point, it's okay to use the actual user information to hide and show and do different things based on your UI on the client, but the actual verifications and checks all need to happen on the server to make sure they can do the things that the client says they should be able to do. So now that we understand how all of these different processes work, I actually want to show you it working on a live website. So we're actually on my own website for where I sell all of my different courses, and we're just going to log into an account. So I have an account on this website. It's just a test user I use for testing things. I'm going to click log in here and you can see that I'm logged in and I have access to this one free course. Now, if I inspect the page real quick, I go over to the application tab. This is where you can see all the information. And if we go onto the cookies section for my course, obviously there's tons of stuff. But the thing that you're going to see, if we just expand this a little bit, that's really important, is we're going to have to find essentially our ID. And I already know for a fact that this is usually called something like session or SID. And in our case, if we just say here session, you can see we have this underscore Podia session. If we just click on that, you can see we get this really long cookie value. And this is just a bunch of jumbled up text. It really doesn't matter what this is. It's just a unique identifier that's saying this is me. And the important thing is if I delete this, it essentially is like the same as logging me out because this is what the server, or I'm sorry, the client sends up to the server every time I make a request to verify that this is me. So if I delete this, and I just come over and I refresh my page by hitting F5, you're going to see immediately it's logged me out. And that's because that session ID that is being stored in my you know, cookies is what is actually verifying that I'm logged in and verifying who I'm in. So if I just come in here, I log in real quick, what we're going to do is we're actually going to copy that entire cookie. So I'm just going to do a quick inspect here. I'm going to go over to the application, get that cookie, and I just want to make sure I copy it all. So we're just going to right click. Um, yeah, I think I can just do this. Okay, there we go. That's going to copy the value for that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up a brand new tab. We're just going to go into incognito mode, courses, page here. We're going to go and we're going to inspect. I'm logged out. Obviously, I'm in a completely new you know, tab. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to create a brand new underscore podia underscore session. I'm just going to paste in that value. And now if I just refresh my page, it'll show that I'm actually logged in. As you can see, now I'm actually logged in. I can view all the different products that I want to. So it's really important that you make sure you securely store this session ID because if someone else has access to it, they can be logged in as you without even knowing your username and password. I was able to log in without using my username or password. So this session ID almost acts as like a username password combination that shares and verifies that you are currently who you are. And that's the whole idea behind that. So the next thing I want to show you is actually an implementation of how this works on the server side. It is going to be written in Node.js, but it really doesn't matter. It's going to be super simple code, so the language itself is not at all important. So here I have a really simple application. I have three different buttons that are going to do my different logging in of different users. I have a button to try to query some admin data, and then I have just a div to show the response of what's happening. On my client, everything is really simple. When I click those buttons, I'm going to be calling login with the username WDS. Kyle or Jim, and that login function just makes a fetch request to my server, which is just going to pass along our username. 
Then we have this button to get the admin data. Again, it's going to make a fetch request to my server and it's going to try to get the data that is in that admin data route. Now these fetch requests right here, the important thing about these, these are like the requests that are being passed off to the server. So when I try to log in, I'm making a request to the server that's saying, hey, try to log this user in with this username. I don't have any password authentication in this application, it's not important, but if you want to learn how to do password authentication specifically, I have multiple tutorials covering that. I'll link in the cards and description of this video. Now, if we jump over to our server, this is where pretty much all of the important code for this project is going. We just have some setup code up here. We're setting up cores to make sure cores works and just more setup code. Here we have our user database. This map right here is essentially simulating our database of users, and we only have two users. We have WDS and we have Kyle. WDS is an admin and Kyle is just a normal user. Then we have a map that stores all of our sessions because we have these unique session IDs like I showed on my actual website for my courses. And these session IDs are you know, what verify that you're actually logged in and determine which user is corresponding with which session. We need a way to link those two together, which is what this is going to do. So let's look at our login route right here. What we're gonna do is when we log in, we're gonna take the username and check to see if we have a user with that username. Now, if you did password verification, you would have to check that as well. We're just getting our user. If we don't have a user, we return a 401 status code, which says that you are not authenticated to access this because your data is incorrect. And if you wanna learn more about these HTTP status codes, I have a full video on them. I'll link in the cards and description for you. Next, if we are a user, then we're gonna create a session for that user. I'm just getting a random UUID. It doesn't really matter, just some type of unique identifier for that user. And what I'm doing is I'm just setting that session for the user and then this is the important part. I'm sending down a cookie and this cookie is secure, HTTP only, and I have same site set to none just because my server and my client are running on different URLs. They're on different ports. I have one's on port 3000, as you can see, and my site up here is running on port 5500. So this is important if you're running on a different URL that you need to set this to none. Otherwise, you can set it to same or what is it set to? Yeah, strict. And that means it's always going to be only for the same site. So in our case, we need none here. So this is really important. Secure means that it can only be used on HTTPS sites, which is, you know, pretty much any site should be that way. And HTTP only means you cannot access this via JavaScript. The client cannot access this cookie at all. This is really, really important because it means that you can't actually accidentally leak this data because nobody that has access to JavaScript on your site has access to this. It only gets sent along to the server. So only HTTP requests have access to this session ID. This is really important to understand and why you should always store these types of sessions in a cookie and not in some like local storage or session storage. Then I'm just sending down the text that says you're off as that user. So to show this working, let's just refresh our page here and click in login WDS. You can see it says auth as WDS. And if I inspect, go over to my application here. Let me just do this real quick again. Refresh, click the login button. There we go. Go over to application tab. You can see we have a session ID with this value. And this value is just a random UUID that's generated on the server. And on our network, you can see we actually have that login request. And if we look at the headers, you can see here that we have a cookie being set. It's saying, hey, set this cookie, which is the session ID. So it's being passed down from the server, which is great. So we can do that as WDS, we can do it as Kyle, but if we click on login Jim, there is no Jim user. So we're getting that unauthorized error being sent to us saying that Jim does not exist as a user. Now, the next thing that we have in here is this get admin data. And to do this, what we're doing is we're passing or we're checking our session, sorry, for the cookie that is our session ID. And then if we don't have a user, that means that we either passed up no session at all, or the session that we passed up doesn't actually match up with any of our sessions. In that case, throw down an error that says you're not authenticated because you don't have a session. If you do have a session and you, we wanna check your role to make sure that you're an admin. If you're not an admin, we're gonna throw down a 403, which means you're not authorized to access that information because you don't have the correct permission. Otherwise, we're just gonna send down all of our fancy admin stuff, which is just a simple string. So if we test how this works, I just refresh my page. Let me log in as Kyle and I'm gonna click get admin data. You can see it says forbidden because while I'm logged in as Kyle, Kyle is not an admin, he's just a normal user. So he does not have access to the admin stuff. If I just do a refresh, log in as WDS and click get admin data. You can see I get it just fine because I'm authorized to get that information. Now, the one important caveat to make sure all of this is working just fine is if you need to use cores when you set it up, make sure you allow credentials to be passed. That essentially stands for cookies. You're allowing your cookies through. And on the client, whenever you make a fetch request or Axios or whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that you include the credentials by passing this line right here. That's going to make sure that the cookies get passed along with all of your different requests. Otherwise, they don't get passed along by default. If you remove this line, nothing at all is going to work. 
Now also to recap exactly the process of how this works, what happens at the very beginning is we're going to be trying to send a request from the client to the server saying, log me in with this username and password. In our case, it's just a username. On the server, we're getting that information and what we're doing is we're checking to see if this user's login credentials are correct. If they are not, we send down an error. If they are correct, we create a new session ID for that user. However you want to create that session ID, it doesn't matter. But the important thing is we save that session ID somewhere, usually somewhere like Redis, for example, and we make sure we tie the user to that session ID. That's the really important part here. And then we send down a cookie that's saying, hey, this is your session ID for you to use throughout all of your different you know, uses of this application. Then back on the client, you know, stuff is happening and now the user wants to get some data, protected data. Well, we're going to send along a new request that says you want to get that data. And on the server, what we're going to do is we're going to get the user from that session because we stored the session and the user together using this code right here. So we're going to get the user from our session. If there is no user, obviously no one's logged in. If the user doesn't have the correct permissions, we throw back any necessary errors. And then based on the user's permission, we show them the stuff that they have access to or allow them to perform some action that they're attempting to perform. The really important thing to understand here is that this session ID essentially acts as like your login credentials. This is like you saying who you are. That's what the session ID is doing. So it's really important that we make sure we keep that secure and that we don't leak that anywhere on the web because otherwise people can access and use your account using that session ID. That's why generally it's a good idea to make sure you periodically remove current sessions from your session map. So if a user has been inactive for a certain period of time, we remove that session. Think about if you've ever logged into a bank account and left it open on your screen for a while, it'll usually pop up a message that says, hey, if you're inactive for five more minutes, we're going to you know, log you out automatically. The way they log you out is by removing the session from the server. That's all that they do. The final important thing to understand about authentication is most of all of the complex stuff around dealing with sessions and cookies is almost always gonna be handled by some type of library. For example, Express has their very own Express session library that handles all that for you. Next.js has like their own next auth that you can use. Pretty much any major framework or tool out there is going to have some type of library that makes dealing with this so much easier. So I'd recommend just using that, but it's also nice to understand exactly how it works behind the scenes so you can easily troubleshoot things or add on new features if you need them. And that's all there is to understanding auth. If you wanna go even deeper into implementing specific auth things like JWTs or username and passwords, I'm gonna have videos on those linked right over here. And with that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.